Welcome to the online worship service of Northeast Presbyterian Church. We're so glad that you're joining us to worship at your house today. And as the great song says, there ain't nothing like the real thing, but we are grateful that we can still worship. We do miss you. We miss seeing you here in this beautiful sanctuary at 601 Polo Road. Uh, We know that you miss seeing us and we miss seeing you, but we are grateful for the technology that we have that enables us to do this virtual worship service. And we hope and pray that it won't be too long before we will be able to gather again to worship the Lord we, in person. We do want to let you know that we really have a one-stop shop for everything you need to find out about our church, and that's the page on our website that's our Connect page, and you can find that at anypresbyterian.org slash connect. Again, that's anypresbyterian.org slash connect. At that page, you can find out everything you need to know about our church, including what we're offering during these unusual times. Well, if you're new to us, my name is Josh Desch. I have the privilege of serving as the next senior pastor of Northeast Presbyterian after our founding and current senior pastor, Pastor George Crow, retires. And the reason that you will not see him on the service today is a wonderful reason that is a great cause for rejoicing. Georgia Brooke Hughes was born on April 20th in Charlotte to parents Adam and Emily Crow Hughes. We rejoice with Emily and Adam and with the newly minted grandparents, Pastor George and Kathy. We also celebrate the birth of Eleanor Stewart Fowler, also born on April 20th. Eleanor was born in Myrtle Beach to parents Michael and January and big sister Juniper. So congrats to the Fowlers, and we miss you guys. And also, on a sad note, I do want to let you know that Ruth Astle, sister of Loretta Lilly, passed away on Easter Sunday, and that Nancy Kierkees, wife of NEPC deacon Charles Kierkees, passed away on Monday, April 20th. And so our condolences to both families. Well, we are here today to worship God. And if you were living in the first century at the time of Jesus, you, and you were a faithful Jew, you would have thought, you know, to worship, I need to go to a synagogue. And if I really want to worship God, I need to go to the city of Jerusalem, the holy city, and then I need to go up to the temple, and that's where God can truly be worshiped. But in John chapter 4, the Lord Jesus tells us that God can be worshiped anywhere and everywhere and he calls on us to worship him in spirit and in truth. So let us prepare our hearts. Let's engage our hearts this morning as we come to hear God's truth, sing God's truth, worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Would you join us now at home as we sing the song, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah.
We now come to the time in our service where we confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. And I know that as a pastor, one of my favorite parts of the service is to lead the creed and then get to hear all the saints seated in the sanctuary saying the creed together. So even though we can't do that today, I would encourage you to say the creed at home. And I would encourage you to say it loud enough so that the person sitting next to you can hear you. And kids, I would challenge you to say it loud enough so that mom and dad can hear you confess your faith. So let us now join millions all around the world, yes, even today, all around the world, millions, confessing their faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us go before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise and worship You this day. We do thank You, Lord, that wherever we are, as Jesus told us in John 4, we can worship You in spirit and in truth. Lord, we do miss one another. We miss being together. We miss being in this sanctuary. And we pray, O Lord, that you would keep us strong, give us endurance, give us patience in the midst of these hardships. Lord, give us grateful hearts for all that you've done. We thank you for our health. We thank you for the finances to pay the bills. We thank you for food on our tables. And Lord, we do thank you as well for the ways that Northeast Prez is seeking to be your hands and feet to our community around us. Thank you, Lord, for Susie Necker and the others, the mask makers who are uh, helping to make this personal protective equipment for so many. Lord, bless the work of their hands. Father, we pray for all of those who are hurting today. Some are hurting physically. We pray for healing. We pray for comfort. We pray that good medical care would be provided for them. We pray, Lord, for those who are hurting economically that you would provide the funds that they need to continue to provide for their family, that they would not lose hope, that they would not become discouraged. Lord, we pray as well for the lonely. So many are feeling disconnected and longing for those relationships as they were before this pandemic hit. Would you bring them your comfort and your peace, and would you provide a, a, a gentle voice, a kind word, from a loved one or a neighbor or for someone in this church to bring them comfort. Lord, we can do nothing apart from you. And we pray that you would guide us. These are uncertain times and we need our great Jehovah to lead us forward each and every day. So build us up in our faith, we pray. And we pray this in the strong name of Jesus, who while he was on earth taught us to pray saying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Boys and girls, I hope that y'all are doing so great. I'm missing you so much, and I cannot wait until we are back down together in NEPC Kids doing stories and games and activities together. This morning, I'm coming to you to tell you the story of the road to Emmaus. In the book, of, in the Bible, in the book of Luke, there is a story of two men who are followers of Jesus walking down the road to a town called Emmaus. While they're walking to Emmaus, a man that is a stranger to them, who is really Jesus, um, disguised as a stranger, begins walking with them. 
Jesus asks them, what are you talking about? What is this big news? And they were so surprised that he had not heard this news yet. The news that Jesus had been arrested and how he had been whipped and beaten and made fun of and how Jesus was sentenced to death and hung on a cross to die. Then he was placed in a tomb and covered by a rock. The two men told Jesus about how three days later, Jesus' mother and another woman brought gifts of perfume and spices to put on Jesus' body. But when they got there, they saw an angel who said that Jesus wasn't there, that he had risen and he was alive. The two men on the road said that the woman rushed back to tell the news of Jesus to his friends. Um, When they heard about it, they went to the tomb and saw that the the stone had been rolled away and could not believe this. This was exactly what they were told was going to happen. So as Jesus listened to the two men tell this story, he couldn't believe how surprised they were by all that had happened. As they walked, Jesus asked them, why are you so surprised by this? Moses and the prophets said a long time ago that this was going to happen. So Jesus went on to explain how he was the savior that Moses had, had told them about and, and that had been talked about in the scripture. Later that day, when they reached the town of Emmaus, Jesus and the two men sat down to eat together. As they sat and ate, God revealed the stranger to be Jesus to them. The two men couldn't believe it. The whole time they had been talking with Jesus. And as soon as they realized that it was Jesus, Jesus, when he disappeared, Um, the two men immediately found the disciples and told them that he was alive. The Lord had risen. This story is a reminder of how Jesus has power over sin and death, that he had risen from the grave He used this as a way to show the power over sin and death. Because Jesus has power over sin and death, we can call on him to be saved. So boys and girls, today my prayer for you is that you can call on Jesus just as these two men called on Jesus and they were with him, um, that you can call on him to be saved and to have him in your hearts. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna pray together. So let's bow our heads. Dear Lord, thank you for dying on the cross for us. Um, Thank you for sending Jesus to live on this earth to take our sins. Um, Just as these two men had Jesus following with them, Lord, I pray that you allow Jesus to be with all of us and to be in all of our hearts, Lord. I pray that our children are able to call on you when they are in need, Lord. Um, In your name we pray, amen. Oh
Savior ever true. Oh, Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. Well, good morning, Northeast. I am delighted to be with you this morning and delighted to have the opportunity to open God's Word with you this morning. So I want to invite you to take a Bible and turn to the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 24, verses 13 to 35. It's the story of the road to Emmaus. And the title of my sermon this morning is The Road to Emmaus and the Road to Jesus. And so while you're getting your Bible and turning to that story, uh, we'll be reading that here in just a few minutes. But I wanted you to know that my family loves road trips. We love loading up in the van and going on vacation to Florida or to the mountains or really to anywhere. And one of my favorite parts about road trips is punching in the destination on my Apple apps and looking at that app and seeing the estimated time of arrival and just knowing without a shadow of a doubt that I can beat that time. Of course, until we get to the highway and the first kid has to stop and go to the bathroom. I'm sure we've all been there. But you know, with the invention of the cell phone and with the invention of Apple Maps and Google Maps and Waze, it is nearly impossible to get lost. Now, I say it's not entirely impossible. It does happen, but it's nearly impossible to get lost on a trip. I don't know about you, but my wife and I, we have had a few tense discussions on road trips, 
as I'm trying to follow the directions on my map and getting us lost, and she's trying to tell me to use the app that she prefers, knowing that my app is much more inferior to hers. I think it must be a rite of passage for married couples to go on a road trip together and fight over directions or getting lost. I don't know if you've had that experience. And it reminds me of a story when I was a kid, when one of the biggest arguments I remember my parents getting into was over directions on a trip that we were on. We were in the Tampa Bay area for spring break, going to Bush Gardens, and one evening we decided we wanted to go to the beach. And we were on Clearwater Beach, but the problem was we couldn't find the beach. And as I think about the situation now, I'm astounded that we couldn't find the beach. Between dad getting us lost and mom having her U.S. atlas on her lap because she could never go anywhere without her atlas giving him directions, I couldn't imagine just, hey, go west and you'll run right into the ocean. But we finally made it with a few twists and turns, and I'm convinced, I'm convinced that all of that happened just to give me better illustrations and sermons today. In fact, there's a picture I want to show you because the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. This was a family trip that we took back in 2015. My whole family piled into a 15-passenger van and made this trip to North Florida, where my grandma and grandpa are buried. And there you see in this picture my mom with her map in her lap in the front seat and me right behind her with my Apple Maps on my phone trying to chart the best course, the best direction to get where we were going. Now, what in the world does all of this have to do with the Bible? Well, the Bible is a lot of things. The Bible has commands that we are to obey. The Bible has lots of stories for us to read and engage with and learn from. The Bible is a prayer book where we can use what is in the Bible to worship the Lord and to come before Him with prayer. The Bible is filled with wisdom for life that we are to follow. But this morning, I want us to see, and I want us to see Jesus confirm this in our story, that the Bible is primarily a roadmap. It is a roadmap pointing us in the direction of Jesus, His person and His work. God in the Bible has revealed to us the person and work of Jesus, and we want to see that this morning. So let's turn to the first part of our story. In Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 35, we're going to start with the first section and read verses 13 through 24. Follow along with me and hear God's word. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. And then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death, and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it's now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. So this is the first part of our story. And Luke sets the scene and he introduces us to the three main characters in the story. 
were on a road traveling from Jerusalem to Emmaus. It's a village maybe west of Jerusalem that's about seven miles away, as Luke says. And this story takes place on the very day that Jesus rose from the grave. In fact, it's that afternoon that these two men are going away from Jerusalem, leaving the Passover celebration and heading back home to Emmaus. So the three characters. First, Jesus, obviously one of our main characters, and these two followers of Jesus, these two men. One, the Bible tells us, is Cleopas, and we don't know the name of the other follower. Now, these men were not a part of the original 12 disciples, but they were a part of the ring of followers of Jesus that had gathered together in Jerusalem. And as we'll see at the end of the story, they go back to the 11 and back to the women who gave the reports of Jesus' resurrection. And so these men are very faithful followers of Jesus. And it appears that they have been for some time. But with everything that has happened in Jerusalem, we see them sad and perplexed and confused as they go back to their hometown of Emmaus. And on the way, and especially as they get there, they are going to encounter Jesus and have an experience that will change their life forever. So as we think about this first section of the story, my first point is this. Is Jesus lost? Is Jesus lost? Now, the obvious answer to that question is, no, he's not lost. But it is interesting that he pretends he acts as if he is lost in this conversation with these two disciples. And I think in this story, we get a great picture of the humanity of Jesus. Because I think as Jesus is having this exchange with these two men, he is sort of suppressing a smile, maybe even a light chuckle as he comes up to them and he says, hey, what conversation are you guys having about these things that have taken place? And they respond to him, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem that has no idea what has taken place? And he's like, what things? What's happened? And then they go on and they tell him the story. And I think it's funny. And I think Jesus is smiling, thinking, well, of course I know this story. It all happened to me. But it's it's like this. Suppose you make your run to Target tomorrow and you go in as a good citizen with your gloves on and with your mask covering your face and you're keeping your appropriate six feet between you and the nearest shopper and you're being safe. And then somebody comes up to you and they start asking you questions. Hey, why is everybody wearing gloves? Why is everybody wearing masks? Why is there plexiglass between me and the cashier? Why do we have to stand on the big red dots that are six feet apart from each other? And why is there no toilet paper? You would look at that person as if they were crazy. How in the world are you the only person in the world that doesn't know what's going on in our world? That's exactly what was happening with Jesus and these two men. Because you see, everything that these men described, everything that had happened in Jerusalem was a very public event. Thousands upon thousands of Jews had traveled to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. The trial between, uh, in front of Pilate with the crowd yelling and chanting, crucify him, crucify him. It was a very public spectacle. Jesus carrying the cross to the point of death was a very public spectacle. And certainly the execution was before the eyes of all to see. And so if you were in Jerusalem and you had no idea what was going on, you were lost. And Jesus plays lost in our story today. But ultimately, Jesus is wanting to get these men to tell their version of the story so that he can redirect them, change the course of their life as we go on in our story. So is Jesus lost? No, he's not lost. He pretends to be lost to make his point here in just a minute. And so to go to our next point, I want to pick the story up in verse 25 through 27. If you'll look back at our story, let's read this together. 
And he, Jesus, said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. My second point this morning is that all roads in Scripture point to Jesus. All roads in Scripture point to Jesus. Now, when I was going through seminary, I found it very funny when there were students in class who disagreed and debated with the professor. And most of these would be the 23 or 24-year-old college student fresh out of college thinking that they know everything. I don't know if you've ever encountered someone like that. And they would sit through these Bible and theology classes, and they would come to some disagreement with a professor and wax eloquent. And the professor would sit back, and he would listen, and he would smile, and he would nod along. And then as soon as they were done, he would gently say, Oh, foolish students. And he would start listing out all the reasons why they were wrong and the professor was right. Now, I give these two men in our story credit because everything that they had recounted about the events in Jerusalem were spot on. In fact, I really like this because it shows us the veracity of Scripture, that the things in Scripture, and especially the things surrounding the life and the ministry and the events of Jesus, especially with His death and resurrection, they were actual historical events that these two men who were eyewitnesses of everything that had taken place, they're testifying to these things. And they're getting it right. It's spot on for us to go back and read and believe. But Jesus sits back and He listens to their interpretation. And although they're getting the facts right, they're a little bit lost with some of the stuff because what do they say? Oh, we thought that this was the Redeemer of Israel. And especially when it came to the resurrection, well, the tomb was empty is what the women said. They're claiming that He has risen from the dead, but but they don't know. They're confused. They're sad. They're bewildered. They're perplexed at this person who they thought was the hope for Israel was now dead and buried and the whereabouts of his body are unknown. And Jesus sits back and he listens and he responds. And what did he say? Oh, foolish ones, and how slow of heart you are to believe. Man, I can't even tell you how many times Jesus has had to speak that to me. Oh, foolish one, and how slow of heart you are to believe. And that's what he says. That's what he says to these two men. And then what does he do? He takes them on a journey through the atlas of Scripture from Moses to the prophets, showing them how the Scriptures point to himself. He starts with the first five books of the Bible showing creation and showing the calling of Abraham and the covenant relationship God had with Abraham. And he goes to Moses leading the Israelites out of Exodus or leading them on the Exodus out of Egypt and the giving of the law and then going into the promised land under the leadership of Joshua and King David and the reestablishment of the covenant with the people of Israel and goes through the prophets and he goes through page after page, map after map after map, showing them what? Showing them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. All roads in the scripture point to Jesus. And we have to remember that these two followers of Jesus, these two men, Cleopas and the other guy, they were good, faithful Jewish men. They knew the Old Testament. They knew the stories and had memorized the stories and no doubt had recounted the stories to their children. They knew the laws that must be obeyed. They understood the wisdom with which God wanted them to live. They no doubt used the Psalms for worship and for prayer, both personal and corporate. And yet, they missed the main thing. 
They missed the ocean just west of where they were. They missed what the scriptures were ultimately pointing to, which was the person of Jesus who was standing right before them. And we're good Christian people, aren't we? And we read our Bibles and we know the stories and we love the stories and we know the commands that we should obey and we get a glimpse of the wisdom that God's given us and how He wants us to live and we may use the Bible to memorize and to use for worship and prayer and yet as good Christian people, do we miss that the Bible ultimately is a road map pointing us to the person, to the life, to the ministry, to the teaching, and ultimately to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. All roads in the Scripture point to Jesus, and this is what Jesus is teaching these two men and teaching us this morning out of this story. So Jesus is not lost. He's just redirecting these two men to a greater understanding, and He's using the map of Scripture to show them that all roads in Scripture lead to Jesus. So let's get to the third point and the final portion of our story. Let's pick up the story in verse 28. We'll read the finishing part of the story, verses 28 to 35. So they drew near to the village to which they were going, And Jesus acted as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So Jesus went in to stay with them. And when he was at table with them, he took the bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while He talked to us on the road, while He opened to us the Scriptures? And they rose that same hour, and they returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And then they told what had happened on the road, and how He was known to them in the breaking of bread." one of my favorite scenes in all of the Bible. They're almost at Emmaus, and Jesus acts as if He's going to keep going, and these two men implore Jesus to come home with them. It's late in the day. Come and eat with us, dine with us, spend the night at our house, and then you can be on your way. And at this dinner, as Jesus sits down at the table and He takes this bread and He blesses it and He breaks it and He offers it to them, all of a sudden this supernatural transformation takes place in the hearts, in the souls, in the minds of these two men. God shows up in a supernatural way and He opens their hearts and He opens their eyes to see and embrace for the first time that day the person of Jesus right before their faces. And did you catch the response? As soon as that happened, they said, What did our hearts not burn within us while He opened to us the Scriptures? And my third point this morning is another question. Does your heart burn? When you hear Scripture, when you read Scripture, when you sit under the teaching and preaching of God's Word, does your heart burn within you as it reveals to you, points you in the direction of Jesus? That is the response of these two men. Once Jesus put the whole picture together for them, does this happen to you? Does your heart burn within you? because of the Scriptures pointing you to Jesus. So I've been actually just finished uh, some reading. What I've been reading is uh, The Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Duchevsky. It's a 19th century Russian novel. And uh, maybe this quarantine thing has got me reading things I would never read. But there was a scene in this book that absolutely captured my heart. And the scene 
is with a priest, a monk. His name is Father Zosima. And he is essentially on his deathbed and he is recounting to the people gathered around his bed his testimony. And a big portion of his testimony was how the scriptures changed his life. And I wanted to read you two quick quotes. Here's what Father Zosima says. I only speak from rapture and forgive my tears for I love the Bible. And then he says, the people is lost without the word of God for its soul is a thirst for the word and for all that is good. Does your heart burn when you are under the scriptures? Do you love the Bible? Do you feel lost without God's word? These men were lost trying to figure out what in the world was happening around them until Jesus opened the scriptures and took them cover to cover, book by book, map by map, showing them in the scriptures all that pointed to himself. And then something supernatural took over. And this can happen for us today. Jesus takes us cover to cover, page to page, map to map through the scriptures, showing us the person and work of Jesus. Does your heart burn within you? Because the scriptures point you to Jesus. Now I want to finish this morning with just two quick applications. And the first one is this. I really hope that you do love the scriptures. I hope you spend lots of time in the word. Followers of Jesus love God's word because it's there that God reveals himself and points us to the person and the life and ministry and work of Jesus. I hope you love the Bible and spend time in the Bible. But here's the second point of application. I hope most of all that the scriptures lead you to your first love. You see, we love the Bible, but we don't love the Bible for the Bible's sake. We love the Bible because it points us to our one first true love, Jesus, our Redeemer who lives. The Bible points us to Him. So we love the Bible. We love the Bible because it points us to Jesus. One of my favorite pictures of Lori and I was a picture that we took several years ago. We had gone to Virginia Beach, Virginia. We were attending the uh, wedding of one of our former students. And so we took a road trip up there. And uh, the night after the wedding, our hotel that we were staying in was about a block off the beach. And a block over was the amusement park on Virginia Beach. And it had this huge Ferris wheel. And we love Ferris wheels. And so when we got back from the wedding at like 11 or midnight, we were in our wedding clothes and we said, hey, let's go ride the Ferris wheel. So we took the ride to the top of the Ferris wheel and then took a selfie. And it is one of my favorite pictures of us. And I love that picture. But I don't love the picture for the picture's sake, right? I love the picture because it represents, it points me to the beauty and the glory of my wife. And it's the same with the Bible. We love the Bible, but we love the Bible because it points us to the beauty and the glory of our Savior. So may God in His grace make your hearts burn within you as you read and study and meditate and hear God's Word as it increases your faith in and your love for our Savior, Jesus Christ. Will you pray with me? God, we are so thankful for this story of Jesus and these two followers. We are so thankful for the way that you transformed their lives as their eyes and hearts were opened and as their minds were transformed in understanding truly who Jesus was and what he had accomplished on their behalf. I pray that you work in our hearts, that you give us this love for your word but most of all, that you give us this love for Jesus, the one who has lived a perfect life, gone to the cross in our place and raised again for our salvation. 
Lord, work in our hearts. May our hearts burn within us as we read your word and as you point us to our one true love, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.
Thank you for joining us in worship this morning at Northeast Presbyterian Church. We so long for the day where we can gather and worship in person again, but know that until then we are praying for you. Now receive the benediction. Now may the Son who redeems you and the Spirit who renews you and the Father who receives you, for so great is His love, may He be gracious to us and bless us and make His face shine upon us. Amen. Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave.